Good morning. My name is uh, Gavin Giovanoni. I'm Professor of Neurology at Barts and London School of Medicine and Dentistry, and this is my first COVID-19 uh, blog. I've become quite fatigued and um, tired of the infodemic uh, that has emerged as a result of uh, COVID-19. The reason why I'm doing this is because I had a teleconference yesterday and I was asked the question in the meeting, how do I think COVID-19 has affected people with MS? And do I think the changes or the effects that it's had on the management of MS are going to persist? And I answered the question, but I had time to think about it uh, over the last 24 hours. And I think it's quite worrying uh, what's happened. So as soon as we had lockdown, we had to reconfigure our services and put almost everything on hold in terms of diagnostic workup, non-urgent investigations, monitoring of patients. Um, we switched completely to a telemedicine uh, and we set up video conferencing portal where we could do video consultations. Um, not ideal because sometimes you need to examine patients. Uh, and so, um, Myself and two of my fellows, uh, Cyril Reyes from uh, Colombia, and Uta Smets, who is from Belgium, um, have put together a little video on how to do a neurological examination over a video link. <clears throat> and there are three phases to this, and uh, it's very neat because we, we had a, a meeting and decided what components we could do by observation only. And uh, is, so we can kind of do an examination, but it doesn't get away from the the human interaction you have with a face-to-face -face consultation, and some of the body language you miss when you um, do video conferencing. The worrying thing is post-lockdown, when the lockdown gets removed, because of social distancing, we're going to have to probably have a hybrid model where very few patients come up for face-to-face -face consultations, and we'll probably still do um, um, a, a video follow-up. Uh, and that may persist simply because when it comes down to economics, the payers, the healthcare systems, may realize that this is more economic use of time and, uh, and resources. And uh, they will probably want to reimburse the healthcare systems um, uh, less for a telemedicine uh, follow up. So that's one change is unlikely. Other things that have changed is we've uh, increased the infusion gap for people in natalizumab, for example, to six weekly, and that's called extended interval dosing. And that's likely to stick because it looks like the efficacy is much the same and it reduces the risk of PML, which is a good thing. Um, we've also sped up the infusion time. That's likely to stay. Because, and we've also allowed patients to go home who are very much quicker. They don't have to hang around um, after the infusion. So uh, we've increased the efficiency of uh, infusions in, in that regard. I can't see us winding that back. Um, home infusion service has been set up for some patients, and I suspect if they like it, they want to continue with home infusion. So why not? It's a, uh, that's an innovation that may be beneficial. Um, we've also set up home phlebotomy for some patients for pharmacovigilance for monitoring. Uh, and I suspect if they like that, they're not going to want to come to hospital with their GPs to have their bloods taken. Why not? If it's convenient to have somebody come to your house to take your bloods and collect your urine, uh, you, want to, you wouldn't want to roll back that service. So, that's, so these, are, these are very good things. <laughs> Other things we've done is we've um, uh, created online portals. Uh, I created a microsite called MS Selfie for, for people to uh, get information rapidly and ask questions. And I suspect uh, a lot of people, a lot of patients may want to continue uh, being able to ask uh, healthcare professionals questions and get an answer. Uh, but the idea, the idea of the uh, portal is that everybody has access to the answer. So you don't have to keep repeating yourself. So that may stay in terms of distribution of information. Um, Self-management. We have uh, encouraged patients to self-monitor for urinary tract infections using dipsticks um, and how to drop off urine specimens at the GP for sending off to the lab, uh, how to access potentially uh, uh, antibiotics beforehand. In other words, they get a prescription and only take it to the pharmacist if they get an infection. So we're actually empowering people with multiple sclerosis who've got certain symptomatic problems to 
uh, self-diagnose, self-manage, uh, and complement uh, and speed up uh, the process, which is also a very good thing. Um, a lot of the stuff we do in terms of monitoring people, in other words, our disability, we do a thing called the EDSS, which is the Expanded Disability Status Scale. We've encouraged patients to now do the online calculator on our clinic speak work site to measure their own walking time and uh, we're providing a cardboard nine or pet test so they can measure their own upper limb function and they will be providing us this uh, prior to their consultation so that's also an innovation in other words we're shifting the monitoring burden from us the healthcare professional to people they may the individuals to monitor themselves and how the disease impacts on themselves we're also preparing a pro forma uh, for people to prepare for their consultation. So they will be filling in a, initially a paper-based version, uh, and hopefully it will eventually be digital on an app or on a website. And so we capture um, uh, information prior to the consultation to actually make the consultation run a lot more smoothly. We won't have to repeat ourselves and we can get information around, for example, current medications and what symptoms or what problems uh, of, of should we prioritize in that consultation. So um, we, there are some positives coming out of it in the sense that we are rapidly changing our um, uh, MS service and we're not going to roll back on it. <clears throat> so those are the good things. Um, uh, the bad thing is there's been a massive delay in diagnostic pathways. So a lot of our patients are uh, probably got MS, they probably need to be on a DMT uh, and we haven't finished the diagnostic workup. So they're waiting for MRI scans or lumbar punctures or electric fibrovoke potentials. And we really need to get the diagnostic pathway moving. So we're going to have massive delay. And I'm a big proponent of time as brain. And a lot of people are losing brain because we've got delays in diagnostic pathways. Some of those patients have gone on to have uh, relapses. I know one patient has gone on to have a, a, a quite a bad relapse. Um, and it's unacceptable. You know, we shouldn't be compromising the way we want to care for patients. The other thing that's down is when the government announced the original lockdown, they basically frightened the living hell out of some people with MS and told them to self-isolate and they had high risk of getting COVID-19 and high risk of dying from it. And some people just spontaneously decided to stop taking their medications. And so we've had a flurry a small flurry, I wouldn't say a large number of people who have uh, stopped medication or their medication wasn't given to them and they've now come in with major relapses. And I was just boasting uh, a year ago how we've transformed the management of MS. That we hardly ever see uh, catastrophic or massive relapses in people on DMTs. What we tend to see is people coming through the door with their first event um, through the A&E department, maybe be it a, a spinal cord relapse or a brainstem relapse, has been the big attacks we see. However, in the lockdown, we've seen quite large uh, uh, relapses, big, big relapses that we ha haven't seen in, uh, for, uh, for several years. And this is driven by the fear that the government guidelines created in the MS community with some patients stopping medication and having um, uh, rebound uh, activity. Um, rebound activity is really limited to uh, people who stop their uh, fingolimod or their medalizumab. Some centers actually stop infusions completely and a lot of those patients are extremely anxious about having rebound. Uh, I'm talking about medalizumab infusions. And so the interruption in the MS service has been quite profound. Um, the other thing is a lot of staff were redeployed. So our MS service went from uh, a functioning service to very narrow skeleton staff running it. And so people with MS were having enormous difficulties uh, contacting their MS and critical nurse specialists or getting to speak to their neurologists or senior neurologists. So they were neglected. And um, uh, that's one of the reasons why we created the uh, MS Selfie microsite to try and address some of the concerns they had. Um, I don't know how successful it's been in that because not many people have used it. The number of uh, the traffic was several thousand a day and it's, it's now down to uh, maybe 500 visits a day. So the, the, uh, the need for it, I think, has uh, come down uh, as the epidemic has moved on. 
Um, the other thing that was a big negative is that the information that was given out wasn't standardized, it was conflicting. Uh, I suppose that's to be, to be understood because uh, there wasn't much evidence to support uh, various advice, but some people told patients to shield, others not to shield. And so the average person with MS was very confused and is still confused. I still get emails or questions on the MSL through microsite by patients being told, I've been told to shield. And when in fact, you don't have, they don't have to shield. I, I think the, the good news is that the data that's emerging from all the registers um, around how people with MS are dealing with COVID-19 is very reassuring. And, uh, you know, we're trying to go back to as normal a situation as possible where we are beginning to start or retreat or continue as normal, except for two therapies, that's alemtuzumab um, and HACT, which are associated with quite profound immunosuppression in the first few weeks. Uh, and it's quite difficult for patients to shield for three to four months until their immune systems recover from those two procedures to be safe. Um, also, HACT is not in our control. Uh, we refer our patients to the uh, hematology uh, service for that. And at the moment, the hematology service aren't running uh, uh, HACT for autoimmune diseases. So it's not in our control. But that brings up the other issue is we have seen quite a few people being de-escalated from what we supposedly uh, more risky therapies, which I don't think are more risky. Um, to platform therapies are less effective. And this is particularly worrying if you, uh, somebody's got a poor prognostic profile with high disease activity uh, are now being offered less effective therapies and that will come at a cost to these individuals and post lockdown, they may not be escalated back to those treatments. Uh, and so I suspect um, a, a large number of people with multiple sclerosis will be disadvantaged by the treatment choices that were made uh, during the pandemic. Um, the other thing is it's also may, maybe uh, nudged us all to be more risk averse. Uh, and so prescribing habits uh, or prescribing patterns may not go back to normal. Right? And we've been working literally for 10, 15 years to try and uh, get this message across that uh, time is brain. Uh, EMTs are prevented. In other words, they prevent damage. And we should not linger too much over decision making and uh, we should uh, do rapid escalation or flip the pyramid and offer people high efficacy therapies uh, first line. And uh, that whole policy initiative, that whole uh, education thing may be revert. And my big, big worry is that the immune reconstitution therapies, these are the therapies that are given as pulse treatments, you know, usually at two cycles, Cladribine and alemtuzumab um, are going to fall off the radar and most people are not going to use them anymore because they worry about the potential uh, risks. And I think COVID-19 has uh, created the, uh, first of all, lump those two therapies together as if they won, but they're not. I mean, there's clearly a different profile for alemtuzumab versus cladribine. But I think there's going to be a nervousness post COVID-19 for using immune reconstitution therapies. And they weren't that popular in general prior to COVID-19. And I think they're going to be less popular, uh, which is extremely worrying because the results of alemtuzumab, for example, in terms of long-term remission and impact on the end organ in terms of slowing down the brain volume loss and protecting the brain are unremarkable. It's our most effective therapy when it comes to normalizing brain volume loss in people with multiple sclerosis. Uh, and it's in a similar uh, ballpark to HACT. So I suspect we're going to see a, a massive fall off in prescribing of immune reconstitution therapies. And the reason why it upsets me is because I don't view those treatments as, as the uh, ultimate cure for MS. They, some people may be cured on those treatments, but it's the beginning of uh, a strategy that I would like to promote is the so-called induction maintenance. So you use therapies like uh, alemtuzumab and uh, cladribine to induce a remission. And then you maintain the remission with a maintenance treatment that's safer and targeting um, the characteristic uh, what, what, think, what, think, what we think is driving uh, MS disease activity, uh, B cell and memory B cell formation, for example. So it's going to uh, seriously affect um, research strategy and some of the research ideas we would like to take forward, uh, we, we, we were taking forward and now we have had to stop 
And I got a feeling that the uh, uh, MS community are not going to look favorably on grant applications to do these studies. Uh, ethics committees may not like the associated risks, et cetera. And so I think um, it's going to take us uh, a long, long time uh, to recover uh, both from a healthcare provision perspective, but also from a MS intellectual perspective in terms of uh, taking forward uh, ideas to uh, tackle this disease long term. All our trials were put on hold. Uh, and some of our trials I think are very innovative in the sense that they are testing really important hypotheses. Uh, and the, the one that we uh, had to put on hold and I hope we can get it back off the ground and uh, we've now got a funding gap because uh, we weren't allowed to furlough staff uh, in our university. And uh, we're now not allowed to spend what we would call discretionary money on salary. So we've got this enormous funding gap. And I assume we're not the only ones. I assume other universities and other investigators will have the same problem. But um, one of the trials is to uh, use a drug for multiple myeloma, disease of plasma cells uh, that is penetrant into the central nervous system. And the idea is we may be able to go into the CNS, uh, target those B and plasma cells that are making antibodies that we think are driving some of the pathology, some of the processes that cause progressive MS. And the idea is to try and scrub the brain and the spinal cord clean of these uh, cells that are independent of, uh, uh, working independently of T cells and other cells that are making these antibodies that we think are driving the disease process within the brain and the spinal cord. Now, I just seriously hope that there's gonna be no more hiccups and we're gonna be able to get that trial off the ground and recruit. Um, for, for us, it's a, a, a big worry and anxiety because um, of the staff that we have to employ in that on that trial and the fact that mm, we have milestones. So if we don't hit certain milestones, the, the trial may be stopped by um, uh, our research office. Uh, and I think the MS community uh, are quite anxious about the potential safety profile of anything that affects the immune system. Um, and so I think, we should all take a deep breath, step back and say, you know, um, let's not let COVID-19 and the post-COVID-19 or the tail of this uh, epidemic or pandemic uh, affect the science uh, that's driving our uh, ideas uh, about really making a, a difference and tackling what I call the real MS, which is smoldering MS. Which, that, that uh, exists beneath the relapses and the broke of MRI activity. Because if we don't take some of these ideas forward, we're going to be leaving uh, people with MS um, and and we're not going to be addressing that scientific problem. So, uh, so those are my uh, initial thoughts uh, on how COVID-19 has affected uh, the field. Uh, I haven't even addressed the social issues. Um, and I'll, I'll do that in another post because I think the social impact uh, and the economic impact on individuals uh, is another story to tell of how COVID-19 has affected people with the disease. So I'll try and do one, uh, one of these next Friday if this works. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a very nice weekend because London is in uh, a wonderful uh, period of weather. We've got beautiful sunshine almost every day with good temperatures. Summer has, has arrived. I just worry that without some rain, uh, we may have a drought this summer. Bye-bye.